morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Special welcome to any of you who are visiting with us. We're glad that you're here. We also welcome those who are worshiping with us online this morning. It is good to have you. First of all, the flowers on the altar are given by Dave and Marge Graham in honor of their 61st wedding anniversary. The other announcements are inside the back page. I've been asked to highlight a few. A new member class will start this morning after worship in the fellowship classroom. As we have all seen in the news, Hurricane Ian did a lot of damage in Florida and the Carolinas. And if you wish to contribute, you may do so through the Lutheran disaster response and uh, instructions on how to do that are in the bulletin for you. Uh, Stephen Ministry Supervision meeting is rescheduled for Wednesday, the 12th of October at 8.30. Beginning Tuesday, October 18th at 10 a.m., the Mental Health Committee will offer a caregiver support group for members and community members, and that will occur on the third Tuesday of each month. Any questions on that? Evelyn Trone is the person to talk to. Worship Matters will start again on Thursday, October 20th at 1 p.m. And Pastor is planning a new Stephen Ministry training class. If any of you feel the calling to be a part of that, this is your opportunity. Also, starting tomorrow, the 10 a.m., Grief Share Group will start meeting again. And on Tuesday at 10 a.m., there will be a meditation group meeting in the fellowship classroom. So if you wish to be a part of that, that's Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Also this morning, we are having potluck. So everybody over to the fellowship hall after worship for some good food and fellowship. I think that about covers all the announcements. You will notice something missing in your bulletin. I know that there is no communion. The reason for that is we have no ordained pastor present, and that is required by the Grand Canyon Synod. And so, and next weekend will be the same. And two weeks from now, I think Pastor Jack will be back. And on the following weekend, I think Pastor Bill will feel like he's ready to come back for a few weeks before his surgery in late November. Please stand. We begin our service by proclaiming God is good. All the time. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us silently confess our sin against God and one another. God of promise, you have given us all we are and all we have and still we have not trusted you fully. We have tried to be God in our own lives, hurting ourselves and those around us in our attempts to control. Wash us clean in the waters of your salvation and bring us back into right relationship with you. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on us the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn is number 652.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God, with awesome power, you led your people through the sea and rescued them from those who would harm them. Continue to lead us through our challenges, that we might sing your praises on the other side. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the worship carol. and temptation. Good morning. Our lesson this morning is from Exodus 14. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the minds of Pharaoh and his officials were changed toward the people. And they said, 
What have we done, letting Israel leave our service? So he had his chariots made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 elite chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there was the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because that we have no graves in Egypt that we have taken us away to die in the dead wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone that we, may, that we can serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians and to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. In the Egyptians or whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went to the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord, in the pillar of fire and cloud, looked down on the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into a panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned very difficult. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. Waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, water forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Word of the Lord. <laughs> Our psalm this morning is from Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God, of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself, and the Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it in your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say that we might see good. Let the right of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, and more than then their grain and wine abound. I will sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. Gospel for this, the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, is from Matthew chapter 2. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. 
and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. The Gospel of the Lord. One night in the middle of the night, a burglar breaks into a house. He's creeping quietly from room to room with his little flashlight, looking for anything of value that he might be able to steal. And he gets into the living room, and he's shining his light around, and he hears a voice. Jesus is near. He looks, who said that? And he didn't see anyone. So, ah, must be hearing things. So he takes a few more steps. Again, the voice. Jesus is going to take care of you. Uh, he's getting pretty startled now. Where is this coming from? Who's saying this? After a few more steps, the voice comes again. Jesus is right behind you. And he shined his light all around the living room, and finally his light hits in the corner of the room a bird cage with a big parrot in it. <laughs> and he walks up to the bird cage and says, Polly, want a cracker? The parrot looked at him and said, I don't like crackers, and my name's not Polly, it's Moses. And the guy said, now who in their right mind would name the parrot Moses? The parrot said, same guy who named the Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> <clears throat> well, today we're going to talk about Moses. Especially the, this morning's lesson is the parting of the sea, the rescue at sea. Um, I like to back up a little bit and kind of put things in perspective and see how we got to this point. Where does Moses fit into all this? And who was Moses anyway? Well, as I'm reading scripture, I discovered it seems like God does things like every three, four hundred years. You know, and to us, that's a long time. When you read it in the Bible, it doesn't seem like a long time. For instance, the Lord decided to destroy mankind with the great flood and spared Noah and his extended family. Abraham was the tenth generation after Noah, about three to four hundred years. So we have the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And last week we heard Pastor Jack tell us the story of Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Now the book of Genesis ends with the death of Joseph at the ripe old age of 110. Exodus starts out, the first chapter, by simply naming the other brothers of Joseph, and explaining how they had all come to Egypt. Joseph had brought them to Egypt. Jacob and all of his sons and all of their families were about 70 people. Came to Egypt. And then verses 6 and 7 of Exodus 1 explains that the remaining sons of Jacob eventually die but their families remain in Egypt and were fruitful and multiplied and filled the land. That was verse 7. Verse 8 starts, Out of Egypt there arose a new king. Well, most biblical scholars think that was Seti I, who was Pharaoh when Moses was born. 
Now we all have heard that the exile in Egypt lasted about 400 years. It started with Joseph and ended with Moses. And so if you read verse 7, how the people remained in Egypt and multiplied, and then verse 8, there arose a new king. Verse 7 covers over 300 years. And in that period of time, um, there were a lot of, of Hebrews in, in Egypt. Well, this new pharaoh feared the Israelites or Hebrews or the children of Israel. And by the way, when you hear that term, and you hear it often, the children of Israel, that's not referring to the country. That's referring to Jacob. Remember, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So anyway, this king feared the Hebrews. There were so many of them. And he says, they're going to take over. If we go to war with somebody, what if they join the other side? We won't have a chance. And so he begins to oppress the people by appointing taskmasters, making them do hard labor, making bricks. And they built for Seti two store cities of Python and Ramses, and they were enslaved. But they still continued to grow. And Pharaoh was still very much afraid of them. So then he takes drastic measure and orders that all Hebrew baby boys be thrown into the Nile. With that many people, that was a lot of baby boys. Well, then we hear the story of a Levite couple from the house of Levi who had a baby boy. Knowing that Pharaoh was going to send someone to take their baby and throw him into the Nile, they hid him. And they successfully kept him hidden for three months. And when they could no longer do that anymore, of course, the mother puts the baby in the basket and puts him in the river. And he's found by Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter adopts him, and it's Pharaoh's daughter who names him Moses. Moses grows up in the house of Pharaoh. And a few verses down the line in Exodus, we read where when Moses had grown up, doesn't say how old he was. Again, scholars. And if you do a lot of research on the Old Testament history, you will find that the most learned of biblical scholars cannot agree on things. That's because Scripture is rather vague. Uh, for instance, we don't know exactly if that Pharaoh was Seti. In Scripture, Pharaohs are never named. They're just called Pharaoh. So anyway, Moses grows up, and they figure he's about 25 years old. And he rides out to see his people. Well, Scripture says his people. So apparently Moses knew that he was a Hebrew by this time. And he sees the Egyptian soldier beating this Hebrew man. And so Moses kills the soldier. Pharaoh finds out, orders Moses to be killed. Moses flees to Midian. Midian is a great wilderness to the east of Egypt in what is now northwestern Saudi Arabia. And it included the Sinai Peninsula. So Moses goes over there as a young man, gets a job as a shepherd for the priest of Midian, a man named Jethro. Marries one of Jethro's daughters, Zipporah. Together they have two sons, Gershon and Eleazar. And when you're a shepherd, you don't just get up in the morning in your house and go out to the field and watch the sheep. You're constantly moving. When the grass gets low and the water gets low, 
you pack up your tent and your family, and you move. Moses had moved Jethro's flocks into the Sinai wilderness, to the base of Mount Horeb. And that's where he sees something burning. And he goes over there. That's when we find out who Moses really was. Because if you're sitting there now with this vision of Charlton Heston, <laughs> that, no. That wasn't Moses. God appears, and by the way, Moses was about 80 years old now. He had been uh, raising his family and living in Midian for 50-some years. So God tells him, I have heard my people cry out. I am sending you to Egypt to confront Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Now, did Moses say, yes, Lord, I'm on my way right now? Mm -mm. Moses said, uh, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> Me? Go back to Egypt? No, 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 no. I can't, I can't do that. I can't do that. Because he knows that he'll be killed if he goes back to Egypt. So what does God say? He reassures Moses. No, no, no. He says, the people who sought to kill you are all dead. It's safe to go back now. But Moses still resists. No, 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 no. Please, please send somebody else. I, you know, I'm not a good speaker. I just, yeah, no, I can't do this. I can't do this. And so God kind of makes a compromise with Moses and says, okay, how about if I send your brother Aaron with you? Aaron's a good speaker. So finally, God, who's a little peeved and impatient now with Moses, gets Moses to go back to Egypt. And he uh, meets his brother Aaron, who was older than him, in the wilderness, and they go before Pharaoh. And then all kinds of strange things started happening. And if you read about the ten plagues, a question that comes to my mind is, why is God doing this? The Exodus story, more than anything else, is probably one of the greatest displays in Scripture of God's power. He is saying, here I am, I'm going to show you. It was almost like the clash of the titans. God stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Egyptian gods and wins. And finally, God uses Pharaoh's own trick. God sends the angel of death to kill firstborn in every household. And we have the first Passover. Which brings us to today's lesson. They travel out of Egypt. Most scholars, again, think that this was about 15,000 people. A lot of people bringing everything they had. Sheep, cattle, whole households, everything they had. They're following Moses. And they get to the sea. It really wasn't the Red Sea. They were traveling north. The Red Sea was a couple hundred miles to the south. Most likely they came to a large lake, a very large lake in the Nile Delta called the Sea of Reeds, the Reed Sea. So they get there. And now what do we do? And what happens? They all turn on Moses. Well, some rescue this is. What are we going to do now? We'd have been better off staying in Egypt. Fine thing this is. Moses says, be patient. God will deliver you. 
And then Pharaoh changes his mind. And if you read the verses, God did this on purpose. It says, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now God had already won. Pharaoh had let his people go. Why did God choose to anger Pharaoh and make him change his mind and send his whole army, 600 chariots after them? Was it to show the disgruntled people who had turned against God and Moses standing there at the shore of the sea? Don't know. But again, God chose to show who he was. And so, God tells Moses, stretch forth your hand. And perhaps the most bizarre thing that has ever happened in the history of the world, God sends a strong wind and parts the water. As I was reading this, I tried to imagine what it was like to witness that. I mean, you're angry at Moses. You think you're going to die. And they don't even know it yet, but Pharaoh's army is not far away. And they stand there and watch Moses and the waters. And the wind blew all night, so the waters didn't just go. It took all night. And in the morning, God again shows his power. He comes down as a great pillar of fire, enshrouded by clouds, and looks at Pharaoh's army and causes them to get stuck in the mud, and they're just all... And as soon as the children of Israel were all safely on the other side, he tells Moses to stretch out his hands again, and the waters crash in, taking Pharaoh's army. Again, just an enormous display of God's power that we, you probably won't see anywhere else in Scripture. So, they tell me the purpose of a sermon is to relate Scripture to your lives today. Pastor Bill does an excellent job of that. So I'm thinking, you know, The Exodus story is a story of oppressed people enslaved by a tyrannical administration. If you think about it, that's a story that has repeated itself throughout history, over and over and over again. God has provided Moses in many of those cases. I think of back in the 1850s in the southern United States. A slave escapes, a young woman. She escapes to her freedom in the north. She's not satisfied with her own freedom. So she goes back to the south and personally escorts 70 people, some of her own family, through what was called the Underground Railroad to their freedom in the, in the North. Her name was Harriet Tubman. And she, after that, she helped hundreds of slaves escape through the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman has been called the Moses of her time. More recently, you know, I think of Yuma native Cesar Chavez, how he fought for the rights of oppressed field workers. Today, do we have oppressed people and tyrannical governments? I think of the people of China, North Korea, Russia, especially Ukraine. Is there a Moses among those people? I think there is. 
I really truly believe there is. And the reason is, there's a powerful lesson that you can take from the Exodus story. One that repeats itself over and over and over again throughout scripture. And that is this. God always keeps his promise. Please stand. Using the words of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Powerful Deliverer, you free your people daily from sin and death. Remind us to practice gratitude for the amazing lives you have given us. God of promise, Amen. wise guide, 
Hold the hands of the children you have called to be leaders in this world. Help them to become fully reliant upon you for their guidance and strength in their daily decisions toward justice and peace. God of promise. Benevolent healer, bring to health and wholeness all who suffer ailments of body, mind, and spirit. God of promise. Just ruler, you are the God of all people. Help us to remember that all the children of the earth belong to you, and that none are left to suffer at our hands. God of promise. Together we pray. We pray for all our mission congregations, local partners, and our care ministries. We also pray for the congregation's vision process, for God to work so clearly in the process that only God could get the credit, for us to be both dependent on God and confident in God, for us to have increased sensitivity to discern the leading of the Holy Spirit, for God to enlarge our hearts toward people far from God, for a fresh conviction to speak the truth in love and embrace transparency, for God's wisdom to permeate the process, for an increased passion for the beauty and potential of your church. Maker of saints, with gratitude, we remember all who have come before us and remain faithful to you through lives of extreme challenge. May we follow their example until we are reunited in your holy presence, God of promise. Trusting in your grace and mercy, we lift these prayers to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. The ushers will come forward to receive the offering. Together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our sending hymn is number 619.
Again, all are invited next door to great food and fellowship. Remember, Almighty God has created you and has a purpose for your life every day. Lord, help us to remember, if you are not dead, <laughs> live your lives in Christ, rooted and built up in him, and abound in thanksgiving. And may the blessing of the Holy Trinity, one God, be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is sending you.